So we left off with uh, Brother Lawrence giving particular advice to individual uh, people. Um, now, I did mention he was unlettered, but coming into Carmel, they have lots of prayers, uh, reading of prayers, reading in Latin, as we just talked about. So he would have been able to do some of that over time, if nothing else, but from memory, from rote memory. Uh, he uh, would have been exposed to the teachings of Teresa of Avila or John of the Cross just by being in that atmosphere. But because his duties were first to the kitchen and then later sandal making, he was not always at the prescribed times of prayer because he's over in the kitchen getting things ready while the so he would be up late at night um hours in uh, the presence of the lord and finding his other ways for spiritual nourishment and of course there would be some times where they would all gather into community but it wasn't like uh, it wasn't frequent it would have been an, an infrequent occurrence um let's see yes he died at the age of 80s as a holy and consecrated man, and he never wandered from his initial conversion, there of 18. And that reminded me of Paul, because Paul was very much like that you know, just with his encounter on the road to Damascus. Yeah. I do think that it speaks to the, the, the power of an authentic counter with Christ. And I, I think that there is, it's a, we're hard pressed to find that now um, in the same vein because of all of the noise, you know, that we're dealing with um, all the time, the internet, the telephone. But during Lent, you know, it is a moment to, to try and walk into a silence. Uh, and and it's only there really where you're going to be able to have that encounter because you think of how often you know did brother lawrence walk past that tree how many times did he see a tree not in bloom right before that moment impacted him but once you have that impact i do think that there is some element to that that is profoundly life-changing particularly when it is and maybe that's actually one of the signs of an authentic of an authentic moment of grace, right, is its ability to endure, to, yeah. to give consolation and solace, even during the hard times. That's right. That's right. And I'm glad you bring up um, the profound silence, because we're going to talk just very briefly of some of the Carmelite practices Brother Lawrence would have had. So he said, like, he wasn't always able to go to uh, the choral office, for example but he would recite a certain number of our fathers instead. So you start to see he has a, that allowed him an elasticity, if you will, mm -hmm. with religious practice. That if he was always, oh, spirituality consisted all, only in the quarrel, that we, he had to find other, other avenues. Mm -hmm. And you're exactly right. There was profound silence in the monastery. Because again, this is in the Reformation time frame, and it it would have been of uh, you know in keeping with uh, the norms. Teresa and John of the Cross would have uh, encouraged, put down that sort of thing. Um, and yes, he pr would pray at night. And um, okay his intended audience, uh, he assumed all of this would never be published. He, he, so he gives very free advice, thinking nobody else is going to read it. It's kind of like Teresa of Avila. She, <laughs> she's altogether sure nobody else is going to read it. It's, you know, it's, it, he, she does it under obedience kind of thing and that sort of thing. Teresa uh, Tres of Lachier is the same way. Yes, it's only under obedience that she puts pen to paper. Right. And that's when she's in her agony, suffering and dying. Right. Okay. So 
he would have. So, so <clears throat> the Martino one, he would write to a nun, to a spiritual director, someone who is a, gives direction to others, to a woman. Uh, there are different types of writings we have. We have spiritual maxims, and uh, this book has sources that these other types of uh, translations don't have. So this is really a very, very complete uh, uh, account of what Brother Lawrence would think or wrote or that sort of thing, or people. Yes, or the conversation. So he will have spiritual maxims for conversations. So he's not writing that. That's going to be this uh, uh, grand vicar who's going to write this. Um, Beaufort, Monsieur Beaufort, he was the grand vicar to, um, I guess, Monsieur de Chalons, formerly the cardinal of No Ollie's. No. Yeah, <laughs> Karen. <laughs> so he's so it is to Buford. Let's call him Buford. It's okay. to Buford that we really have <laughs> the work that we have before us. Okay. And um, he he will write. We'll have four conversations with uh, Buford, and we'll write in total that we have fifteen letters, including one written just a few days before his death as well. Yeah, it's quite a it's quite a work. Um, I, I think that we have a tremendous loss that's going on right now because we're so noisy. Now, even you know, one of the things that I find profoundly um, like surprising every time I, I think about it, um, I'm reading through Dante right now, and it's just astounding how much he just knows. Mm -hmm. what he just carries around with him as part of what would be sort of his, the patrimony of what was given to him. And, you know, we really are suffering from a lack of depth right now. But a man like Brother Lawrence, and even like I, I would dare to say, um, Father Jacques Philippe, these are men who have a profundity of thought, but uh, the articulation of a simple person a simple man. And so despite the fact, and, and St. Therese of Lisieux would probably be very, very similar to that. They are, they are capable of saying so much with so little. And now we say so, they, they, they say, we use so many words to say nothing. You know, they say so much with so little and we, we say nothing with so much. Um, and that becomes real, a real problem because people will talk and at the end, there's still a hollowness, an emptiness, a hunger, because there hasn't been any profound, profound truth. There's been no depth. And really, I do think another element of it is that there's been no moment for silent introspection. Um, we've talked about this a lot of times, about how the Blessed Mother pondered things in her heart. And actually, I was just reading about that. Is that what I was just reading about today in, in this? Or maybe it was a different reading where she doesn't, Mary doesn't take it to an intellectual place. She takes it to her heart and thereby is instructed in the wisdom of God. And I think that a brother Lawrence is similar to that, right? It's not an, it's not an intellectual instruction. It's an instruction to the heart that he's capable of bringing out so that people can meditate upon it, so that they can ponder it. Um, and incorporate it in their own life. And not only, I mean, obviously both he and the Blessed Mother not only received this and pondered this inside their hearts, they lived it profoundly um, exteriorly. So people not only heard what he said, they saw how they behaved. Oh, exactly right. That will be exactly right. And uh, how he lived is going to become important as we move forward. All right, my friends, let's pick up. Let's get to it. The thesis statements and what what is what is it with Brother Lawrence? Children, <laughs> Vita, Sidrachia. 